Um, my name is Bill Dempster. I'm 360, uh, or sorry, uh, CEO of uh, 360 Public Affairs. And uh, it's been my, uh, my honor to, to help uh, and work with, uh, with Durhan through um, the, the third of uh, three webinars that we've been doing on the PMPRB changes and the, and the guideline changes in, in particular. Um, and uh, we, we want to give a shout out uh, briefly to a few supporters uh, in part to help make this uh, webinar happen. That will be uh, Roche, AstraZeneca um, and Janssen. Um, I would like to remind the, the attendees and, and we've had over 200 people um, sign up for this, which is fantastic for a midsummer uh, roundtable webinar. So thank you. Um, uh, please use the, the questions box here uh, to, to pose your questions. Um, the panelists will do their best to, to, to uh, get to them and I'll, I'll do my best to pull them out and, and help lead the discussion that way. Um, today's format is going to be a bit different than previous uh, roundtables and, and panels that we've done in that it will be primarily roundtable. Durhan uh, Wang Rieger, the, the President and CEO of CORD, is going to um, do a quick recap on a couple of slides just because this is the penultimate um, uh, webinar uh, in advance of uh, the, the guidelines um, being due, uh, submissions being due on Tuesday. Uh, however, um, we're really looking forward to, to hearing from the, the people that we have online um, uh, and as you can see on the screen. So um, I'll introduce them. Of course, I've already mentioned uh, Durhan Wang Rieger, uh, President and CEO of, of CORD um, and the, the host of, of today's webinar. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Mike Drummond. Um, he, uh, Mike barely needs an introduction. My one of my favorite papers ever written by an academic was about gold standard health technology assessments. Um, that Mike was the lead author on, and uh, we're just thrilled to be able to have uh, him him here with us from from uh, from England. Uh, we've got Dr. Anil Khan, uh, the Department of Medical Genetics at the University of Calgary, uh, very um, uh, world recognized uh, researcher and clinician in, in, in pediatrics and uh, and metabolic um, disorders uh, in in Western Canada, but but uh, globally um, recognized. Um, Ed Dibka, uh, President and General Manager of Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals uh, Canada, um, with deep industry experience um, that, and, and actually experience on, on this issue at the federal and, and provincial levels. Um, Rosalie Wyanch, uh, many of you have probably seen her um, uh, represent the C.D. Howe Institute um, and written several papers on, on these issues and, and very involved from an from a economics and policy perspective uh, on this. So thank you so much, Rosalie, for joining us. Um, and Fred Horn, uh, a policy analyst who was on, I think, webinar number two back in the spring. Um, and for, of course, former uh, Alberta, Alberta Minister of Health. And um, I'm grateful to have uh, Fred as a colleague at 360 as a senior advisor to us. So. With that, uh, Durhan, I don't want to waste any more time uh, on, on the setup um, unless I'm missing anything. I'd love to turn it over to you to, to walk through um, where we are and, uh, and then help kick off the discussion. Thank you very much. And Bill, again, thank you for uh, being the constant moderator for these panels and the, um, the expert uh, for me behind the scenes in terms of making sure we get all the issues and get the right people identified. This is, as Bill says, the third in the second series that we've done on webinars in response to the PMPRB. It is actually our sixth webinar because we did a series before the first draft, um, following the first draft guidelines and felt compelled to do a second series uh, following the uh, launch of the second draft guidelines. And we really have been able to have, I think some brilliant dialogues around the concerns, the issues, um, and even in response to the PMPRB's own forums. And I, you know, this is for us a hugely important venture. I think partly because we have been very, very disappointed with the regard to the kinds of consultations that the PMPRB has done, and hopefully uh, we'll get a chance to hear from people like Mike and Fred, you know, who work in other environments, including Rosalie, what a you know much more effective kind of consultation process needs to be in order for us to be bringing in such, um, I think, uh, large-scale changes. I, so this is our last one, and as Bill says. Uh, it will, in fact, um, just predate then the submissions uh, for August the 4th. Next, Bill. 
So these are the capping uh, arguments that we've had so far. You know, so we're just coming into, as I said, the last one. I think one of the things that everybody has had agreement on is that the country changes. So the changes, as we said, have to go from seven countries that are the reference countries to 11 countries, dropping the top two um, most expensive countries and looking at the rest and going towards the OECD medium is something that I think everybody can come on board on. And it really is something that we feel if we're going to be implementing the guidelines immediately, and now of course scheduled for January the 1st, 20. 21 that would be the place to start it's clear it's straightforward and hopefully it will give what um, the intentions are and that is to bring the list price of drugs down significantly um, we are very concerned of course is that we need to make sure that we i think it like in every country we want to make sure that the developers that are coming into it are able to feel that they're not only getting fair prices, but prices that they can really use in order to continue to develop drugs. And that the payers, of course, are also able to afford for their broad populations, the medicines. And that means though, that we have to kind of make this work together and that the changes as the PMPRB is bringing them in, we really need to make sure that this is going to get us closer to that in a good way, rather than making it worse. The last uh, point that we've had, I think everybody's you know, kind of been able to talk about is that we have not seriously considered the alternatives under the proposals for the PMB. And I won't go into all the process concerns that we've had getting us to that point, but we are really you know, looking at just one alternative that has been presented. We've been continuously being funneled into that. And we really need to take that big step back and have the opportunity to say, what are the alternatives? And I think especially because we've got such amazing therapies coming forth, all of us have agreed, I think, um, that the system doesn't work. And that doesn't mean just Canada, it means global. And you'll hear some of the you know, uh, other experiences as well. And what we want to be able to do though, if we, as we're creating a new system, is to create one that's looking at the drugs that are here today, the innovative therapies, and as importantly, the drugs for the future so that we get it right. We wanna make sure these new therapies, these innovations and for rare diseases, but also for others are coming in. And uh, paradoxically, Canada is in fact proposing other forms of uh, access strategies, other forms of funding that would actually stimulate the access to these therapies mm -hmm in a more reasonable and affordable way. And the PMPRB proposes we run counter to them. So as a country, on the one hand, we're actually looking at more responsible uh, ways that we can actually bring in these therapies appropriately. And on the other hand, we've got a, an initiative run from the PMPRB that's likely to not only cut it off, but move us in the in an opposite direction. It is important, as we say, is that we really need to make sure that the federal government and the federal government to the provinces and to all the payers get it right. Next slide, please. So this is what I've just said before, is that, you know, how what's the changes or envisions? I won't belabor it, so hopefully everybody's been on, is on this, has, has gone through this ad nauseum. We're changing the uh, basket of reference countries to setting the maximum list of price. We're gonna go from seven to 11, dropping the two highest, adding five lower prices. This would get us closer to the OECD medium, which seems to be, you know, the desired uh, landing spot for a variety of reasons. The new things that are also being in included though, which are the heart of the contentions, is the setting of a regulated maximum rebated price. And this price will in fact be, and the word unilateral is cannot be overstated. All of this is gonna be controlled by the PMPRB, notwithstanding the many other ways in which prices are actually not only uh, determined in terms of cost effectiveness, negotiated in terms of uh, affordability within the drug plans, and then monitored in terms of their ongoing use, notwithstanding we already have an elaborate system that is in place, this is in fact the proposal from the PMPRB to actually be able to do it using these same factors, but to be able to set it unilaterally. Um, and as uh, those of you have been following some of the federal legislation, uh, federal court hearings will know um, they, they aren't even gonna be allowed to actually monitor 
that maximum rebated price. So the irony of it is that um, they have the right to set these regulated prices, um, but they may have they have no right to actually see if in fact those maximum rebated prices are actually what are the prices that are actually being charged. And we are very, very concerned in terms of how it's being done. This slide just shows us very quickly in terms of what the changes will have been. Um, the US continues to be the very highest um, country uh, with Switzerland. Just again, parenthetically, as uh, those of you who may be following what's happening in the US, um, and of course, we're all fascinated by what's happening in, in the US right now, um, is the most recent um, disturbance towards Canada is the executive order from President Trump to focus on uh, prescription drug prices in the US, lowering prescription drug prices, reinforcing their uh, um, what has been previously in place, not yet implemented, to allow uh, US uh, drug plans to actually purchase drugs from Canada, not the way it's been doing now on a one-on-one -on -one basis, on a single pa patient basis, but to allow drug plans to whole scale, wholesale, be able to purchase from Canada, which of course is its own separate concerns, but from a PMPRB point of view, raises some significant questions for us. Number one is whether or not the prices that we're, we're negotiating for Canada, you know, could be and should be extended to uh, the U.S. Um, drug programs that are, are wanting to buy them. And two, if we look at what the proposals are in this use of the economic factors, one of the factors that would determine how much rebate, how much the prices have to be discounted from the list prices are based on the volume of sales in Canada, meaning the greater the sales, the more uh, the, uh, the developers will be required to discount if in fact we're selling into the US, do those sales count as part of that discounting? It would mean not only have we already got an impact in terms of Canadian prices, rebated prices, but this could be significantly exacerbated if the US gets its way and the federal government, our federal government is not able to stop them from being able to purchase drugs that are intended for Canada and being able to divert them to the US. So here's where we are now in terms of the, um, the current prices um, with regard to um, our current prices. Here is what we're anticipating, you know, if in fact the a basket of 11 countries is implemented, it will get us to about the OECD medium. It will bring us to what we have said previously is about 20% below what the current list price is. I mean, this is a somewhat of a fluid number because there are some changes now that we've gotten some some updates in terms of what the last uh, list prices are, but it will bring us down to what I think the PMPRB said the intention was, and that is bringing us in line to about 20% below uh, what the uh, previous prices have been. So this is could be done with just that change in terms of the reference countries. If we implement all of the economic factors, the PMPRB would actually be driving the prices down significantly. And what we've done in terms of that estimates are somewhere between 20, 60 percent below what the current prices are. And again, that's the point at which I think we have a lot of contention because not only are they driving the prices far below what the other countries would be, other developed countries would be paying, putting us in a terribly unfavorable position to get access to new therapies, but actually because they're going to be regulated will not actually be the basis of negotiation the way the system's working now and have tremendous inflexibility for innovative therapies coming in for which the current system still isn't doing a very good job in terms of setting rebated prices, but at least under the current system, we can negotiate in order to get these prices uh, to the point where they're acceptable to the developers and also uh, manageable by the uh, drug plan. So we are very concerned and it's really the second part of the economic factors that we're worried about. Here you can see very quickly, and again, I think most of our audience is probably very familiar with this. This is how the prices are currently set. And again, we're not saying that this has been ideal. If you look at the picture, it's time intensive, it's labor intensive. The health technology assessment process is in the middle there, run by CADET and by um, INES, does not necessarily take into consideration the best way of, of uh, evaluating setting a value proposition for the drugs, but it is a system 
that is more or less workable. Um, the challenge under the PMPRB, as you can see by the slight arrow to the right, is it chokes off the rest of the system. It, you might as well throw away the rest of the system because what the PMPRB will do is that they will in fact be able to, as we said, unilaterally set that maximum rebated price, not a negotiated price, not a price under which we can really look at what are the differences. And not only that, they will be doing it you know, on a basis of their own um, singular assessment of what the value of that therapy is, meaning what is the category level in terms of innovation and the likelihood of, of, of impact. So this is a huge concern for us. You know, Not only is it going to, I think, well, it already has discouraged you know, therapies from coming in, but it also you know, will further exacerbate that in terms of the reality of it. Not the least to say the process is still highly uncertain. We, have, we do not have clarity in, from the reviews of huge number of experts in looking at what, what the PMPR has proposed, the certainty in terms of how those maximum rebated prices will be set, what that discounting would be, what category these drugs will fall in, and what the future will be as the volume of, uh, or of the uh, sales change or as the indications might expand. So again, introducing huge uncertainty both for the payers, but also for the patient and clinical community. Um, maybe I'll leave it at there. We have talked previously about the impact that it's had in terms of clinical trials, which we know have dropped significantly since even the introduction of the discussions around them for Canada. We've also seen some huge pullback from the companies. And I think we'll have the, some of our experts speak to that and the realities of what the reaction of the companies will be. So I'll leave it at that, Bill, for the discussion. Not Thanks here. so much, sir, honey. That, that, was a, that was a great intro. And, um, you know, my first question, uh, we can't see him on screen, but he, he's, he's with us. Uh, great, Ed, thanks for coming back. Um, Professor uh, Mike Drummond in, in, in the UK, the last time I saw you was actually in Ottawa in 2018 at a conference board roundtable um, where, you know, the, the whole question of using HTA in the context of price regulation was, was discussed. So you've had a, some some opportunity to come to Ottawa and, and take a look at what the, what they were planning to do, going back a couple of years now, and more recently, um, you published a paper on access to rare disease medicines in, in 37 countries. It, it'd be great to get your your updated take on on the the proposed system. Is this the type of regulatory system that that you would recommend to the UK uh, Nice um, uh, Agency? Yeah, well, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Um, yes, we, we just finished a, a project for the European Union studying um, health technology assessment of rare disease treatments um, in 37 countries, which we have good data on 32. And I think the main message that comes out of that is that in assessing these kinds of treatments, which are often challenging in terms of you know, the, the cost of the drugs, um, some flexibility is required. And, and the reason I say that is that if you look at the countries we've studied, um, quite a few of them have a, a supplemental process just for rare disease treatments on top of their standard way of doing HTA. So these supplemental processes involve things like um, slightly less stringent evidence demands, recognizing that it's harder to generate the same kind of quality evidence if you only have a few patients to study. Um, ways of dealing with the higher uncertainty, um, perhaps by allowing some kind of managed entry scheme where you, you allow the new technology, but you know try and study it while it's being used. And then thirdly, probably most importantly, ways of dealing with affordability um, for these drugs. So a lot of countries, about 40% had these supplemental processes, but the ones that kept with their standard processes always also introduced flexibility in the context of rare disease treatment. So again, we had flexibility in the way evidence was treated, but more importantly, um, many countries have things called modifiers, which 
So essentially reasons to allow the decision-making committee to um, go higher than its normal kind of cutoff in terms of its what it's willing to pay for the new technology, specifically in the British system and, and in the Canadian one, the you know the incremental cost of quality that you're willing to allow. And none of these modifiers pertain directly to rarity, but a lot of them pertain to characteristics that we often see in rare disease treatments. For example, uh, one reason for having a higher threshold would be if it's a very severe disease. Uh, another one would be if the therapy offers a step change in benefits, like a huge increase in survival or quality of life, or if the therapy is one where there's a complete absence of suitable alternative therapies for that condition, or indeed general equity concerns, the feeling that without raising the threshold, some patients would um, definitely be denied access to therapy. So, um, so thinking about NICE in the UK, um, I think my recommendation to them would be more or less keep with what you have, which is they have a special program called the uh, Highly Specialised Technologies Program, which covers most uh, rare disease treatments. And it's essentially the same methods as NICE in general, but it has a separate committee that's much more used to seeing these therapies rather than mainstream therapies and it has a higher decision making threshold it can go to than the, than the standard one so that would be my message um uh, allow flexibility by all means have rules but you know allow flexibility for cases where you feel there's a need to depart from your standard procedure thanks very much and and just one brief comment i know durhan's big brain is going off now caddis is actually undergoing a big reform the canadian agency for drugs and technologies and health and it's actually having separate um review committees for uh single uh therapeutic types so oncology the common drug review blood products etc there might be an opportunity to think about a rare disease committee uh, building on nice but that's for another webinar let's let's get back to um uh, to, to the PMPRB uh, specifically, although I want to build off of something that, that, that you said, Mike, um, in terms of the severity of disease and the potential value of these these uh, these medicines, uh, Dr. Khan, just in, reflecting on your work as a clinician and a researcher, um, can you give us your impression of a potential disconnect between a cost effectiveness evaluation? and the clinical value of these, these rare disease therapies um, and, and any, any uh, preliminary thoughts on you know, the PMPRB's proposed approach and its impact on, on your clinic and the families you serve. Sure, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I think one of the difficulties um, is trying to determine in terms of your question for cost effectiveness, uh, what the uh, what the bars are. Um, I think um, oftentimes when the drugs are reviewed um, and sitting as a medical expert on some of those committees, there's very little knowledge. And it's hard to convey that, uh, let's say on a panel or as a medical review or on a one pager, the impact that these diseases have on the lives of patients. Um, so when those health technology assessments and quality reviews and those things are generated, it's, it's not clear to me that the data capture actually properly defines the impact of the disease uh, if, for some of these patients with rare diseases. So, so there's a problem with that assessment. It's often done in the context of a common disease. So if you have high blood pressure, Yes, there can be an impact. If you have diabetes, yes, there can be an impact. That's quite different than having neuronal steroid lipofuscinosis when you're ha having 30 seizures a day. You can't go to work. Uh, um, or if you're a child, parents can't go to work. They're in hospital a lot. And so those, those sort of factors need to be built in uh, with what the value of the drug is. Um, and right now, I, I don't think the process 
properly defines what those are. Um, I know, you know, it's, it, it, I agree with a lot of the points Dr. Drummond make. I, it, there needs to be some flexibility here. Flexibility in terms of understanding where is the knowledge content on these rare diseases coming from. And there are very few people in the country that understand some of these diseases. Um, so there need to be other ways of um, determining the quality of life and what the impact of the drug is. I can provide my opinion in those cases, and I know many of my colleagues can provide that opinion. Um, there needs to be a qualitative understanding of what the value of that is, uh, putting into scope what that patient's life is. Um, and I don't see it included in the process here. It, it may be included on a cursory basis, but that's really what's missing, is, um, is understanding the impact. Um, I mean, I yesterday I, you know, um, signed off in an emergency approval and it absolved our health authority from any legal obligations in order to get a drug to a patient in Edmonton who's dying of sepsis in the hospital. Um, we got it on compassionate grounds. Um, people with rare diseases shouldn't have to rely on that kind of approach, uh, trying trying to get these deals done. <laughs> uh, doctors putting their head on the line um, in order to get access to care. It, it needs to be part of the system. Their access to care needs to be part of the system. It should not be uh, a favor. They, they are, if you, if you have Morchio syndrome or if you have neuronal seroid lipofuscinosis or Neiman Pixi, one of these diseases, you are as entitled to get health care as if you had B cell leukemia, right? We wouldn't deny that to somebody uh, who had some other uh, disease that we normally wouldn't put these values on. So, um, so I, I think that flexibility and understanding of what um, the context of that drug is and the treatment, and also having sufficient expertise to make that decision from the data standpoint and from the disease understanding standpoint. What, what really disturbs me is the lack of flexibility, the lack of the ability to, the, the, these unilateral decisions. I've seen them. They're not good for patients, right? Uh, there was a drug approved for a rare disease uh, two years ago, um, and there hasn't been a, an agreement. I'll try not to put names out there. There hasn't been an agreement on the pricing of the drug. So one of our patients is without drug, has had neurosurgery treatment, has had other complications. Now won't even come and see me because they're like, we can't get approval. So even if there is approval sometimes, the process is lagging and trying to get access by years. If you're two years old with a rare disease, you can't wait two years, right? So more accountability needs to be put into the system. I, I find it hard to see that we're designing or there's a system being designed where accountability is not part of the process. Um, so anyhow, I'll stop there because I don't know if that addresses your comments in order or whether... <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, no, this questions. is fantastic. In fact, it's um, just we're going to jump over to, uh, to to Ed briefly. But Durham, we do have one question that came in. Did the child in Alberta get the drug needed before their second birthday? And just briefly say yes or no, or that's no. still ongoing. No, oh, the, you know. The, the, yeah. the, what I'm what I'm told is um, there hasn't been an agreement on price, even though the drug has made it through CADIS. No, the drug okay. is not through CADIS. No, the drug is still not even approved the drug is going through health canada is in fact uh, just being submitted the problem is that um the government in principle has said yes the government in principle says we can go beyond the second birthday um but the real problem seems to be the sticking points negotiation over price well, that's, and we yeah, that's a different drug that's that's the gene therapy drug i'm talking about an older story yeah uh, the yes. gene therapy Sorry. drug yeah the gene therapy drug I, I, I think it's also important for people in my position to be upfront with what the therapeutic expectation is. And I, I think 
we all want to do the best we can for our patients. But at the same time, if it's not gonna make a really big difference, I have to say we need to be giving careful consideration to that. And I'm honest with all my patients. I'm like, yeah, there's a drug out there. It's, I don't think it's really gonna change anything. Um, we go with what the data is. So, okay. so I, I won't, I won't comment on any particular case. I'm just giving a, a general issue regarding an older case I had, um, which well, is not. I, I think what most important is that, that, that you're bringing your clinical background, knowledge, and expertise, and you're worried that that level of expertise is not being brought to some of the decisions out of Ottawa think, on yeah. prices, or or out of the process that's been outlined. I, I frankly, I, the. I don't think governments want harm to come to their citizens. So, so I don't think that's, that's an issue. I think the issue is how we set up these processes, how we make decisions, and how we understand that uh, in order for these patients to get access to therapies for which there don't exist any therapies right now, the process of, uh, development and acquisition of these therapies needs to be part of the solution. It, Canada can't depend on everybody else to keep coming up with uh, new drugs. Um, so and that's a great segue to Ed, um, who's got experience with, with a, a very large multinational pharmaceutical company, um, now leading a, a very um, a strong biopharma company here in, in Canada. Um, and you've been living these processes for the last 20 plus years, Ed. And you also sit on the Board of Life Sciences Ontario, and we, we were fortunate to have Jason on our uh, a recent webinar with us who shared IQVIA data showing that, that you know, the drugs might get even approved by Health Canada, but they're not actually launched or sold here. And in 2019, we had the lowest number in the study period uh, since the early 2000s of, of launches, uh, global, globally launched medicines here in Canada. Did that d data resonate with you? And, and you know, does, does that reflect some of the challenges that you're facing as a, as a leader in, in the uh, industry developing these medicines? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, and thanks for inviting me here uh, to this, uh, this webcast. Um, <clears throat> no, no, absolutely, that data that Jason shared uh, resonates. Um, you know, working in the Canadian pharmaceutical industry, we, we're all uh, subsidiaries of multinational companies. And we are, um, constantly negotiating and fighting with our global head offices to ensure that Canada is a priority country to launch new medicines. Um, and including, we also fight uh, very hard to try to attract clinical trials um, into Canada. And um, uh, by and large, we've been successful. I'd say over the last a few, I've been in the industry over 30 years and for most of my career, Canada has been a very attractive place to operate for a pharmaceutical company and to launch new medicines because it's been a, um, a, a very predictable and, and good environment to operate in. Um, but we, with the PMPRB changes that are being proposed, it is, as Durhan said and several of others have said, it creates a huge amount of uncertainty um, in, terms of, in terms of the operating environment going forward. Um, and all of, almost all the changes that are being proposed are either negative um, or uncertain to say the least. And so, you know, when we're negotiating to prioritize Canada as a place to launch a new drug, whether it's a rare disease or otherwise, the questions come fast. What's the price going to be? You know, what is what what will will what will the uptake be? When will you get reimbursement? Um, it goes on and on, and it's a it's a huge cost to uh, to 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 file and get approval for medicine in Canada, like it is in most markets. And so, without having that certainty, um, there's there is now be, there's, there's now a significant amount of inertia by companies to, to commit to filing with Health Canada, seek regulatory approval, and then pursue reimbursement, which we all know is a long, drawn out, difficult process. So, so there's a lot of inertia, and what we're seeing from that data that Jason showed um, um, a couple of conferences ago, is that uh, the, the number of new medicines being launched in Canada has started to decline starting in 2019 significantly. The number of clinical trials being conducted in Canada has started to, to, to decline. And this is exactly what we had predicted. Um, the other data he shared was a survey of Canadian um, leaders in the pharmaceutical industry, presidents, general managers, CEOs. And there was consensus that these new changes 
to the PNPRB will result in reduced number of new products, or at least delays to the launch of new products, and a reduced investment in pharma clinical trials. So yeah, um, this is a reality that we face. You know, like we're, we're all working for the for for um, improvements to Canadian patients and to bring these important new discoveries to Canadian patients. And these new changes to the PMPRB guidelines are going to put a huge barrier um, in terms of achieving that objective, which none of us want to see. So sorry for the long answer, but that's my first answer to the first question. And I'll be shorter next time. Well, we're going to get into some conversation very shortly. Um, uh, Rosalie, numbers and, and actually looking under the hood and understanding what the impacts are You've, you've actually published some really interesting commentaries through through the C.D. Howe Institute regarding uh, spending on patented medicines in, in, in Canada. Um, and, and the last webinar we had, uh, we actually had uh, somebody analyze spending on rare disease medicines that showed it's about 1.9% of spending on all medicines. Um, what, what are you seeing when you look at the numbers based on some of your data and, and what's been presented on, on these webinars? Um, what's happening with, with, with the actual spending in Canada and, and any, any additional comments on, on the PMPRB changes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I would say that sort of the public debate on drug prices, whether they're too high, too low, I mean, that's something that we could argue about that about just about anything. Um, but at the end of the day, we, we have goals where we want access to medicine as quickly as possible. But at the same time, we don't want the paying for our public health care system to crowd out, um, you know, other important areas of government spending, like, you know, education, for example. Um, and so in looking at the data, it is true that drug spending in Canada has been growing as a percentage of GDP but not public drug spending. It's actually declined slightly as a percentage of GDP. And as well, looking at um, sort of the PMPRB price comparisons over time, what you really see is um, part, of, part of the diver really the only divergence in terms of prices is the US. Otherwise, Canada is around, you know, point, within 0.8 to one point something for price ratios. It's, it's not, unreasonably higher than other OECD countries. Um, and really the US is just kind of diverging from the rest of the world in terms of prices. Um, and so I suppose one of the things that I would say is we weren't actually as far off of the, of what I would say would be the, what the global market has sort of targeted as appropriate. Um, in terms of our relative prices for comparator countries are pretty similar, maybe slightly higher, but the, looking at this data, that doesn't include the discounts. And so it's really hard to tell if we're actually, if we, if our government gets better discounts than um, some of our, some of these comparator countries, the prices could actually be lower in terms of public payers. Uh, so that's, that's one thing is it's maybe that the prices aren't as out of line with other nations as we would we would have or as you would think um, and one other issue that I I think worries me about sort of this targeting of prices is it um, to quote a different Drummond the Don Drummond um, you know good care is really the realm of physicians caregivers people that actually are health experts but once you know we reach a certain pressure that pressure, it will fall to the bean counters to get the system back into an affordable, into affordable shape. And that seems to be somewhat the situation that we found ourselves in, where there's, you know, for whatever reason, we it was drug prices that are targeted. And then the bean counters and the regulators, we go, people like me, we go to work. Where, where are the highest costs? How can we deal with that? And it really is, um, you know, to reference Dr. Khan, it really is disconnected from benefit from patients because that's not the mandate that they have. And so I think that there's sort of this dual pressure and we need some collaboration in terms of uh, getting the bean counters and their, you know, real and valid concerns to talk to the clinical 
the clinical leads, the healthcare experts, and really work out exactly what the, um, I suppose, the either alternate pathway should be for uh, rare, dr rare disease drugs or what the alternate arrangements should be. And I should say the new draft regulations do have, they have made some changes in that direction, but I do have, I haven't had enough time to work out whether or not I think that they would be sufficient. My suspicion is that we we probably should have a few more, um, say, outlier cases or outlier things for the regulator to consider where we would potentially activate a different pathway or a different pricing strategy. But sort of the one last thing I would add just on the PMPRB and since Durhan mentioned the US, um, our use of reference countries, referencing the price in other countries, is what it, what it actually does is it imposes a negative externality on those reference countries. As in, we actually impose this negative effect where it becomes less desirable to launch in the lower price countries that we reference. And either through importation from the US, though that's a lot more complicated and I won't, we should, probably shouldn't get into it, but specifically if the US references the prices in other countries, then it would effectively be placing that externality on us. We have zero control over that. But my worry is that if that happens, it will interact with these hard price ceilings. And the result would be that the maximum price set by our regulator would make it so that there would be no incentive for an international patenting company to launch in the Canadian market to protect their US, um, their US profits. And so since we've changed our basket of reference countries and removed the US, we're perfectly able to do that but the us can also just choose to reference us and then the basket then they're back in our basket whether we like it or not and so i think that these sort of additional dynamics or the unintended consequence where it could paint us into a corner um, in terms of being able to access these medicines should be considered and we should add sort of these i don't know asterisks or strange cases um to the regulations in terms of things that could be considered when things are not a standard case, shall we say. I think, I think Rosalie, if, if I can comment on something, Rosalie has just made some very critical points. Um, and one of which is the focus here has to be on patient care, not pricing. And I, I, I just keep hearing that it's on pricing. And maybe somebody can correct me if that's wrong. I, I don't see the patient care component built into this. The second, or as obvious. The second is that, yeah, if you squeeze one end, when you try to squeeze a balloon, what happens? You get a bulge somewhere else. We, we have to live in the reality that we are a small percentage of the global market and it's very, from a, from a financial standpoint, there may not be any real incentive to for a company to bring a drug to Canada. And what I'm worried about is now those rare disease patients. How do I treat them? And, and what do I tell them? We, we have, I mean, the, because of this COVID-19 situation, we've had many families that were actually going to the U.S. Uh, for treatment from Alberta because they were they had to get involved in clinical trials to get the drugs, and they can't travel anymore. I mean, we're, we've we've made some arrangements with the drug companies to pick that up here, but some of the drug companies won't do the clinical trial here because they don't see marketing access is a realistic possibility. So they're on compassionate care, but what happens after that? And um, I mean, these are diseases that kill people. It, this is, it's not, it's not about just making you feel a little bit better. So, um, so anyhow, I, I agree with your, your points. Uh, Fred, I, I want to go to you next. Um, and I mean, you'll recall back in 2015, you helped CORD launch the rare disease strategy. And you, you in terms of moderating these kinds of um, sessions across the country with clinical experts and policy experts, et cetera. So, and you've been um, on, on a panel like this earlier. Is there anything that, that, that you're starting to, um, to sort of bring together from all the different perspectives to, to, you know, what would you advise the federal government, um, given all the inputs that, that, that you've 
you've had access to on this. And I should even mention the National Pharmacare. Uh, you chaired an important initiative through the conference board. Is there, is there anything that, that you could bring to them on this specific issue of the PMPRB that, that you think would be helpful to, to, to you know, what, what Dr. Kahn was saying and what, what, what's been brought forward earlier? Well, thanks, Bill, and thanks, Dr. Kahn, for the invitation. Uh, I mean, I think I would start by echoing, um, you know, Rosalie's comments about the lack of a policy foundation for any of this discussion. I mean, at best, um, and, and with all due respect to PMPRB, at best, regulatory bodies exist as an enabler of policy that's been set, policy that doesn't address, Rosalie, the bean counting uh, aspects that addresses our long-term um, aspirations as a healthcare system, as a country, around early access um, to new and emerging therapies that have tremendous potential for Canadians. And I, I don't see any of that here. I see the PMPRB having put in a position of having to, to proceed with, um, you know, with a mandate, um, uh, you know, in the absence of any of those um, underlying assumptions or even an agreement among us as a society. The other, it's not just the lack of policy, it's some of the assumptions there are, that are at play. So, you know, to go back to Rosie's uh, comments, if, um, you know, if we've reduced this to a question of, of, of cost containment only, um, then to me that says we're assuming that all other aspects of our healthcare system are operating at maximum efficiency. We know that's not the case, right? We know that is not the case. Sorry, I wasn't trying to attribute that to you, Rosalie, but I'm saying that's that's an assumption, right? If uh, once you jump to cost containment as the only issue that you want to influence as a federal government. So I think I, I'd be advising a couple of things to the federal government. I think go back, um, uh, work with the provinces and, and clinicians and most importantly patients and let's actually have a long-term pharmaceutical uh, vision uh, for Canada. Um, let's do things like finish the rare disease strategy that was launched and, and was actually funded uh, by the federal government recently before we move to including rare diseases under, under these new rules. Um, you know, and on a, from a, a political point of view, I guess I would have two things. One is uh, my comment to the federal government would be, I, I'm going to have a hard time recommending this to my premier. Um, as, uh, as something that should be supported. They don't need the support of the provinces to do it. And to be honest, it's hard to find a premier or health minister that in, isn't interested in, in you know, uh, ways that they can help uh, control costs in healthcare. But I think the long-term impact of, of an approach such as this is, you know, I don't think we have any understanding or we haven't showed sufficient interest in understanding what that might be. The other, the other political point, and, and you know, there would be others on the panel that disagree with me, but there does seem to be, at some level, an emerging consensus around the notion of changing the basket and, and uh, eliminating the U.S. From a political point of view, maybe we need, or maybe the federal government needs to, to hear the message, take yes for an answer when you can. Um, if, if, if that is the consensus, it wouldn't be my consensus today. Certainly drug costs were not the biggest pressure uh, in my term as a health minister. They were important. Um, the challenge of, of dealing with newer drugs that come at a much higher cost for rare diseases and cancer was a unique challenge. And I had to make some of those decisions that Dr. Kahn mentioned. But, um, you know, let's act within uh, what is actually um, as a foundation and policy. And then let's go back and, and, and let's get the rest of the policy right before we move from this environment of, of um, you know, enabling negotiation uh, between industry and public and private payers by setting a maximum ceiling price to what's on the table here, which, which strikes me as really nothing more than price setting. Uh, and that's um, it, it's price setting. And I think it also runs the risk of screening in a sense, it serves a screening function because as, as Ed and as many others have said, um, there will be some companies that simply choose not to launch in Canada. So uh, look before you leap um, would be, I guess, my advice. The win here is not necessarily as big as people perceive. The only people that should be winning in the end are the patients. Um, and so let's get back and, and get uh, some of the discussion much more grounded 
in, in, in their needs today and, and in future generations. Thanks, Fred. You know, and I'll bring it back to Durhan now to, to really open up the discussion. But Durhan, you were on the on the steering committee, the steering the, the steering committee on guidelines reform last year. And, and what Fred said was, "Look before you leap." And it seemed like just looking at what Maureen Smith and others were writing in, in public record about that, it was leap. We've been told to leap. We have to leap. We have no choice but to leap in this direction. And every time you wanted to bring up some ideas that, that forums like this have brought forward, you, you, you were told that that is out of scope, that that's for a discussion later by this other party or something like that. So, you know, hats off to Cord to say, you know what, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to have discussions about alternatives. And maybe that's what I'll throw to you too. You know, what are the alternatives that, that, that you'd like to see um, you know, everyone was, was getting on this webinar and hoping to learn more about what they can put forward in their submission on the guidelines. Can, or is there something that you'd like to see to get out of the guidelines and to think bigger that you'd like to, to say, um, you know, both to the PMPRB, but uh, also to the federal government uh, writ large that we can do differently? What can we do differently here? That's what I'm, I'm asking. What's the, what are the options now on, on these guidelines? Where, where can we go from here? Um, I guess I've got, or oh, sorry, you were going to Durham. I was, I was like, I thought Durham. you were just asking. Durham. 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 Yeah, let me just respond back to the whole consultation and where we are. And, you know, we've gone through a lot of these forums and I think, you know, you will know, and we've said it over and over again. The reason we're holding these forums is because the PMPRB never did have these discussions. And Bill, you know, we've been working with you. We have consistently invited the PMPRB to be part of this forum for us. We've invited them to be part of the audience and we hope they're listening. All the time that we sent for that year on that so-called advisory committee to the, on the, you know, for the uh, guidelines, there was never any advice that was actually taken. There was not really the opportunity to offer advice and certainly not to look at alternatives. And that was the frustration. You know, when we were having some discussions with Mike uh, Drummond, you know, previously, you know, talking about the reform, for instance, of the HST, and I'd be interested in his comment on it, you know, they're holding, having advisory committees, they're actually having open discussions. You know, and I go way back to saying, when these first came out, we looked at them and say, oh my gosh, this is what the UK did about seven, eight years ago, 2012, when they wanted to reform. And when they had the consultations, people threw them out because everybody rejected them as being not only not workable, but actually would be a severe limitation in terms of drugs being able to come in. Everything I think everybody else has been saying here. So our frustration has also been with the process. And now we're left with a process that allows the PMPRB to make these very strong unilateral decisions. And I think what we're begging for is open up truly a process. Let us have expert committees. Let us have, you know, an alternative being debated, you know, in a, a in truly expert public kinds of forms. And I think that's the challenge we've got right now. We have not had those kinds of discussions and we're trying to rush into it prematurely. I think, uh, you know, January, you know, it's not that far away. And I think as everybody says, we've not looked at the alternatives, we've not done hard, to, you know, um, cases that we've looked at in terms of trying to scope it out in terms of what it means. We've not really listened to the manufacturers who say, no, we can't come in under those circumstances. I think you remember I said, you know, when the technical report came out from the group that was a group of experts, so a lot of the bean counters that Rosalie's talking about, they were called in to say, can you give us your advice in terms of what they this work? They came back and said, we cannot confirm it because we don't have the information. We don't have the analysis. And as I said, I think they used the word uncertain 100 times in their report. So what we basically have is, you know, high uncertainty. And this is what we're all experiencing. Um, Durhan, um, do you, I, just a question, if you don't mind me punting it back to you. I mean, I, my point was really that the underlying policy work hasn't been done to support handing this off to a regulator. There's a lot more that goes into ultimately, um, you know, to a patient outcome than the cost of a drug, even if that cost is relatively high compared to the OECD uh, median. Uh, OECD median. There's the question of uh, data and the application of real-world evidence. There are things in use in Europe broadly, um, patient-reported outcome measures. Sometimes they're, they're called by a different name. This is a system issue. It is not an issue of 
the regulation of a commodity. And you know, that's that's my point. Drugs are the technology. I guess I'm just wondering from, from your perspective, uh, would you agree with me that Health Canada needs to take a much bigger lead in terms of the policy development? You, you have worked on a rare disease framework, you know, for many years, which I was pleased to be a, a part of the launch. You, you're being asked, your organization is being asked to help invest a billion dollars in further developing that framework at the same time as the, regula the regulator for drug pricing is supposed to implement uh, a new system that will directly affect, you know, the subject of, of that framework that you're engaged in developing. I, just wondering if you think you're having an opportunity to uh, to engage at, at the right level and on the right issues. Well, no, that's a really wise question, uh, Fred, because I think what we have been recognizing is that there is no guiding policy. There's not been the policy debate. There's not been the ethical debate. I think when we had, um, you'll remember we had PG4A here, and he basically said, we're doing this in the absence of any kind of real discussion around principles and policy, and we're allowing this to become de facto the policy and the policy, I think, as Rosalie says, is just one, and that is how do we keep the you know it's cost containment? How do we keep the price as low as possible? Maybe I would like to just punt it back to Mike, you know, and and talk about you know what you see is happening in the UK because I know you were saying that in the everywhere everybody everybody's having this question, right? How do we afford these innovative therapies that are coming out? I just saw a pipeline report that says by 2030 we will have 60 approved, at least in the US new cell and gene therapies, 60 you know, approved therapies. How are we going to make sure that we can afford them, but as importantly, how are we gonna actually be able to have them financed in a way that's going to be accessible? So it's not like we, we don't recognize that these are important questions, but maybe Mike, can you talk a little bit about what the process is going on, not just in the UK, but internationally? How are other countries approaching this? Yeah, well, I think, but one thing I'd say is that HTA involves a lot of really nuanced decisions. You know, it's, it's like a one size fits all kind of distant rule in the federal government doesn't really speak to the problem. And, and you know, Canada already has a reasonable, you know, well respected HTA set up both at the, uh, you know, CADAS and, and the provincial level and we code of, uh, for cancer drugs, and I, I can't see why you need this thing sitting on top when it's setting the bar so low for what what could come into Canada. I mean, you know, one one thing on the question of gene therapy, I mean, quite apart from recognizing the value of it and whether there are some novel elements of value that go beyond standard therapy, it's also a question of figuring out the payment by looking at innovative payment models. I mean, you, you know, you don't buy a house by spending $5 million up front. You know, you spread that cost out in some way. And, um, you know, we, my country's just been borrowing, borrowing billions and billions of dollars that we're not expecting to pay back for 20 years, you know, but not because of new drugs, but because of a virus, you know. So I, I think you need a bit more lateral thinking. It just seems all a bit, too rigid for me C compared to what I see elsewhere. That, that, that's my that's my main issue with it. Uh, can I comment on something? Uh, yeah, I and I think it's uh, uh, what Mr. Horn said about policy. I, I and he asked if there's agreement. I I agree with him. There needs to be a fundamental foundation of policy goals and objectives that is the 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 foundation of uh, rare disease policy. And, and I think uh, um, that's really how it should proceed. I, I, we're not talking about new principles. We're talking about work that he's done and others have done, uh, CORD has done to put that foundation in place regarding what those arguments and those discussions need to be. And I do think, um, as, as mentioned by Mike, I mean, one of the things that has rotated through my head uh, is, you know, we, we have RESPs for the kids' education. We may need a financial structure for rare disease drugs that um, th the government will allow some uh, tax freedom from that people can contribute to. And at the same time, and I know we're pounding on PRMB on this, that we talk to the drug companies as well and say, 
can we have a new framework for how this funding takes place? Um, we need to bring both sides to the table uh, to, to do these discussions. And, and therefore, if there is a new drug uh, that costs quite a bit of money, yes, you, you, you can start funding it through a special program and then you monitor its real world evidence. And you know, at some point you shouldn't pay for something that doesn't work either. So there needs to be some of that stuff built in. So, so for example, if, and I'm not gonna talk about any particular pace, case, but if we look at gene therapies in general, so, so as you know, we, you know, we did the first gene therapy for Fabry disease here in Calgary. So if somebody says, well, that's worth a million dollars, then you can say, oh my gosh, I don't, it, no price has been set, of course and it hasn't been approved. But what is the cost of treating that patient otherwise? It's actually $20 million over the course of their lifetime, right? So, you, so you, we don't see those numbers come into play, or, or you take a patient who's on a ventilator with another uh, enzyme therapy, if, if that disease took its course and they ended up on a ventilator faster, uh, survival on a ventilator costs more than the drug does. So if the drug can offset ventilator uh, uh, start we call ventilator free survival by 10 years guess what it's actually cheaper <laughs> so so those models often aren't brought into the usual hta formulas that are looked at uh, because it requires knowledge of how these rare diseases actually impact patients um, so what i like to do uh, is usually usually i tell the health authority i'm saving you money i know they find that hard to believe sometimes but i'm like no, but because clinical decisions are made in the best interest of patients, and if you look at it with a really critical lens, those best interest decisions often actually save the system uh, dollars as well. So, um, so anyhow, good discussion points. I just wanted to make a comment. Thanks, Dr. Khan. If you're taking patients, I'm moving to Calgary because I love how you're an advocate and, and the way you frame things. Thank you. Rosalie, you wanted to jump in, and then I'd love to hear from Ed. Is this is industry ready to step up and have these and engage in these conversations that, that that are being called for? Because we haven't heard too much from industry. It's all about what government could or should do. But Rosalie, um, comments on what you've heard so far? Yeah, no, I I just wanted to um, sort of loop back to Durhan's question and maybe tie together a little bit of of the discussion that we've just had. And I think the key phrase for the regulations here is not just uh, cost effectiveness analysis, opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of not having this drug? Not in terms of, you know, how curative is it in terms of patient outcomes, but if we do not have, like, you know, without this, what is the cost that this person will have on the system? And chances are, we, since we already have, um, you know, that care pathway is relatively active and we'll have examples of it, that we know that with relative certainty and that gives us a less subjective measure um, from which to compare any a new treatment and so i guess the first question would be if it doesn't offer clinical improvement does it offer long-term cost savings the answer to that is yes then we should still consider it if it offers clinical improvement and improves total you know total system health costs as in the opportunity cost of not having it outlies its current cost then that should be considered. And so I would just sort of, um, to tie back to the PMPRB, if we could add another thing to consider, it would be health system opportunity cost. Um, but that was just sort of, um, I just wanted to say that point was pretty critical and it was actually what I was, I was gonna add, but in a um, probably a little bit more bean countery fashion. <laughs> no, the only, the only thing I'm, I'm also hearing, Rosalie, as you're adding more asterisks to everything that the PMPRB is doing is starting to look like the tax code. So an exception here, like do this there. And I know we're calling for more flexibility, but you know, that, that's a great segue over, over to Ed in terms of business certainty and, and knowing what you're actually bringing a product into or a research program into, you know, what, what are you looking for? Um, and is anything you've heard here resonating with you as a potential way out? Yeah, lots of great points being made here. Um, you know, regulatory principles should, if you're going to do any kind of regulatory framework, you know, they should have the principles of feasibility, fairness, clarity, and predictability. So, you know, where are we at today? Um, 
we are just half a year from, from the, the launch of these new regulations. Uh, they're going to publish the final draft, I believe, in September. So we're only a month away, six weeks away from the final version. And I can tell you, just to, just to bring it down to a really practical level. So here I am, the head of a, of a pharmaceutical company in Canada. I've spoken to three of my colleagues who are heads of major pharma companies in Canada, and plus two pricing experts in Canada. And we, I, we talked about a, a couple of aspects, we'll get into the details, a couple of aspects about the guidelines. And we're trying to get an understanding of what it, what it means in terms of practically how is this gonna uh, impact uh, some of our planning for some of our products. And nobody, nobody had an answer. So how is it that we, as you know, the leaders of these industries, cannot um, understand where, what the current guidelines are saying and we're just six weeks away from implementing. So that, that hopefully gives you a bit of color in terms of um, what I think um, has been a, a, a fairly shoddy job by the PMPRB in terms of doing their homework because these, these, these guidelines are not predictable, they're not clear, at least at this point, and they're certainly not simple. And we've got to get to a point where they are simple and easy to, to at least interpret. And in terms of uh, you know uh, approaching the government, I, I would say that the industry as a whole has not had meaningful uh, consultation with um, the, certainly not the PMPRB, and and certainly not with uh, with, with with the government in general. Um, you know they've they've established an objective um, to you know lower drug prices, uh, and this is their mechanism of doing that. And um, what's that expression? You know to to the person with uh, uh, with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and so this is just a simplistic approach to try to to, to try to address a a, a a problem in the country, and uh, this this mechanism just is, is is not ready for prime time at this point. Bill, can I just add something back to what Ed says? And as he was saying it, it really did hit me hard. And I think Rosalie, you alluded to it before. You know, we all look at what President Trump is doing in the U.S. and their executive order and how to lower drug prices. You know, and we look at them basically, you know, such, you know, sort of a lack of really understanding in terms of how the system works, a lack of finesse in terms of what could actually be done. And certainly the idea of coming up to Canada to buy our drugs in order to lower their drug prices. I will say is what the PMPRB is doing here is just as benign. And I cannot be any other word than, than that. I mean, when you've got major drug companies that say, we have no idea how we're going to actually predict what our prices are going to be based on what we're seeing here. And when I talked to Mike Drummond about coming on to this in the beginning, he wrote me back and said, could you help me understand kind of what's actually being proposed in these kind of processes? And I wrote back and said, thank God you're saying that. You know, here is one of the renowned experts in terms of, you know, uh, you know, drug pricing, and you can't make sense of it. You know, this is what I'm saying, you know. We really need to do a full stop. When it says we're going to implement this in six months and we have no clarity in terms of how it's going to work, we're going to rely entirely on the PMPRB. We have to take a half step back and say probably to the rest of the world, and this is where I you know, hear Mike saying it very nicely, we look as foolish as the U.S. does. So what the heck are we trying to do here? We're putting our patients on the line. We're taking the risk that we're not going to have these therapies. And we're opening up the door for these kinds of actions. And what the PMPB answer is, well, we can, re, you know, we can redirect. We will take it. And if it's not working, then we'll change it. No, let's do the right kinds of consultation. Let's do the right kinds of, of, of pressure testing. Let's get it right before we actually do it, before we pe put people at harm. So, you know, I, I really hear what people are saying, but really from a patient perspective, you know, this is absolutely putting patients, I think, really at high risk. And, and maybe six months isn't it, you know, you know, maybe we aren't going to die within that six months, but we will certainly um, have a huge disruption in terms of our ability to make sure that we've got this coming in. And we've, we, you know, we, we see that as we're moving forward and looking at the innovative therapies, just to say, it isn't just about rare disease drugs. It's about all the innovative therapies. And it's right across the board, you know, from diabetes to arthritis, to cancer, you know, to cardiovascular disease, all of these drugs are at risk. So Durham, we're, we're 10 minutes um, past the hour, and I, I warned people online through the chat box that we would go a little bit over time. So thank you for sticking around. Um, you know, I don't know if you if you want to want to wrap it up, uh, but you know, from my perspective, this has been 
uh, just such a terrific panel. Um, you know, we've, we've managed to get to, you know, from, from England to the west coast of Canada to, to, to Calgary to Toronto. Um, I mean, this has been fantastic. And one of the, one of the um, uh, comments or questions that came through was, can we keep this conversation going? Can we, is there, are there forums or ways for uh, folks to continue to learn and engage and, and, and bring questions forward? um like this and i think that the the covid reality where we're all working from home has its drawbacks but one of the the positives is we're able to get people from around the world we don't have to actually all go to one place and, and have these conversations so i don't know durhan if, if you want to respond to that opportunity and i know you know rosalie uh, at, at cd how is, is a great forum too for these kinds of conversations and and others are, are involved in other ones but uh any final comments on you know, this this was an idea to to sort of wrap up and summarize some perspectives to help help people prepare their submissions that are due on Tuesday. But I think what you're saying is this is Tuesday is not the be all and end all. This is going to continue. There's no way that they're, they're going to be ready for prime time by September, with all respect to uh, Ed's um, target date that was was put out there. Um, and any final thoughts on, on next steps and then, and then let's, let's close it out today, but let's keep the conversation going. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And first of all, huge thanks to our experts. I mean, this has been an amazing conversation. It was absolutely a wonderful way of closing out the series. I, you know, I couldn't have asked for, I think, more on behalf of our patients and the patient population. We already have in the works, um, I think, planning for having a series of webinars. Really, I mean, we haven't fleshed them out, but I think some of the thoughts have come here. What are the alternatives and what are the other approaches that we can, can we do some better real pressure testing, you know, to add point can we bring some of these therapies forth look at how they might you know actually fare under this system and really put it out there the other thing we're begging for you know back to this whole process is transparency and accountability as we've heard we cannot allow the PMPRB to go into a back room and kind of come out with all of the you know kind of grading in terms of what the category of this drug is what the possible discounts are going to be and then draw a line in the sand and say this is what it's going to be we have to have these done with genuine experts with genuine advisory groups we've got to be able to hold them accountable i mean we've all had concerns when cata first came into place around the accountability the transparency and we will have to say you know they have moved tremendously in terms of you know, their openness and the ability to actually not only query, but to provide input, not perfect yet, but I think, you know, until we get to that level of transparency, we're not going to have the PMPR working. So we will intend to have additional kinds of forums and webinars. And as Bill says, the good news is that most people aren't going too far anyway. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to bring in this level of expertise. And I think I already pre warn all the people that you see in front of you and the two others that, you know, we are moving forward. The other thing we are going to do, though, back to the rare diseases, is that we will begin to put together a working group to implement Canada's rare disease drug strategy. And we do see that as a viable pathway that's going to help us in terms of being able to have a responsible accountable process for bringing in drugs for rare diseases. As many of you know, and I say this publicly again, the uh, previous government promised us a billion dollars to set it up over two years, and that is supposed to take place beginning 2022. So come 2022, we want to be ready. So this, rest, you know, we will be running that in parallel, but it's got to be, you know, done. And it's got to do it from, I think what Fred said, it's got to be done from a policy perspective. It's got to be done from a principles perspective. So there's lots of work to be done, um, but we really hope that we'll be able to have, you know, many, many more of these kinds of engagements. And certainly this has been absolutely, you know, for me, a, a, a tremendous gift for all of these, you know, experts to come in, give us their time, give us their expertise. Uh, we really are so very, very grateful to everybody for, for um, their contributions. We know we're all all at stake here, but certainly at the end of the day, the patients that really, you know, are, are the ones that, you know, have to be able to to feel like, okay, yes, this is all about making sure that we get the best access. So huge thanks there. Thanks very much, everybody. Stay safe, be well, uh, enjoy the rest of your summer so we don't talk to you. And thank you uh, from overseas, uh, Mike, for, for calling in. Really appreciate you uh, taking your time to take a look and, and Jump into Canada. Hope to, hope to get you back here in person soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.